because that makes me a lobby worker. I work with politicians, that probably makes me a political worker too. Um, Sorry for that. So, so the, the yeah, um, this is unnerving. I know. Okay. Um, before I was it set off again. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm not far, right. Okay. Okay. Me too. <laughs> Let's try this with the traditional technology. It's getting hot in here anyway. Um, already. Okay, so I've been an academic full time for the past 10 years, but in my earlier life, um, I was actually a political reporter for newspapers. Uh, then I switched over to public relations and politics, worked with ministers and for regional government as a spokesperson. So basically, in political communications, this is where I've spent half my professional life. Um, I do a lot of consulting uh, on the side. Uh, I do work with industry and business a lot, business associations and um, companies, um, including some of the uh, more problematic uh, branches uh, of the economy. So I've worked with tobacco lobbyists and people who produce weapons and chemicals and pharmaceuticals, yes, uh, I admit it, but I've also worked with a lot of the good guys, including um, a lot of the NGOs. Now, um, about five years ago, a colleague uh, of mine uh, that you, or at least half the people in this room probably know well from last year in Ljubljana, Werner Lindner, approached me and said, okay, I'm working with a project in the uh, land of Rheinland-Palatinate or Rheinland-Pfalz in Germany, one of the regional governments, and we're working with youth workers uh, from local governments as well as from NGOs. Would you be interested in joining us um, as a trainer and as a coach and giving inputs there? And I've done that. It was a new experience in the past uh, four or five years. And actually just last week in, in Tria, we've been working with a bunch of youth workers again. Um, just started out. Uh, and they decided they want to be lobbyists, or at least they want to lobby better for their causes, for their, their own jobs, for their organizations, for young people. And as is very typical for a heterogeneous group like this one here also, some people have had quite a lot of exposure, especially if they do work for a local government. They know the mayors, they know the city council, they know a lot of the administrators. They're part of the administration sometimes. So uh, they're already politically well-tuned. They, they know what's going on, but they need to fine-tune their political tools. A lot of other people, uh, however, um, they are really political amateurs, okay? Uh, they're standing in front of political buildings, in front of um, politicians, and they very often don't really know what to do. So they want to find a totally new toolbox, really. Uh, it's not about fine tuning, it's about introducing them to something new. I think in the past five years we've been quite successful in, in helping people locally and regionally to talk with policymakers and actually influence public policy making, which is difficult in times of severe budget constraints, of legal restraints. Uh, there are always policy fields and other lobbyists who are more important than youth work, obviously. So it's very much about competing with others and often being faster and better than others if you try to influence the policy makers that matter to you. And one thing, one key message is certainly that you need to get out of your own little policy ghetto because the political world is not just about youth work. Very often there are a thousand other things that have higher priority. And if you have higher priorities in other policy fields, it's extremely difficult to get through with your messages if you don't do it right. 
So one of the things I hope you take away from this morning's input is some idea about what actually to improve in your own work. Now, since I'm coming from a German perspective in the German context, um, you might expect that I'll talk a lot about our German project. I will not do that. Rather, I'd like to present to you things that I think are true, or at least helpful, across borders, because you're coming from so many different nations, okay? Um, I'm also not talking just about local governments. I've worked at the local level, regional level, national level, European level, um, and there are things that are very, very different, and there are things that are very much alike if you approach policymakers. And I try to, dis to distill here things that I hope are helpful for you if you're working at the municipal level uh, or higher up in the regional level, perhaps. And finally, before I start here with my, uh, with my slides, I'd like to point out that uh, after my introductory talk uh, with this wonderful facilitator here, we have plenty of time for for extra questions, okay? So whatever is on your mind from yesterday or maybe in preparation for, uh, for today's work, we can just discuss that, fine. And for those of you who are politically well-tuned, you already know a lot about politics in your national or local context, uh, bear with me that some of the slides here are fairly introductory for people who don't, don't have yet that kind of exposure. Okay. Um, if you're talking about lobbying and lobbyists, of course, there are lots of cliches floating around. Um, I suppose that many of you are interested in lobbying as kind of a mysterious way to influence important policymakers, but you all know that there are plenty of stereotypes around that put lobbying in a, in a, uh, in a bad light. Um, and this is the kind of cartoon that you find on the internet quite quickly. So. If you are lobbying for youth work and in youth policy making, then uh, obviously you, you, you don't see yourself like that. Like, you know, this, this reptile with a, with a big suitcase full of money throwing around and, you know, with a split tongue um, hanging out of your mouth. Uh, probably what you feel more like uh, is this, that you stand in front of your town hall and there's this politician who's looking at you quizzically and skeptically and, um, well, kind of doesn't know what to expect from you and you don't know what to expect from this person. Uh, classic questions are, who are you? Why should I listen to you? And what can you do for me? Of course, they will not really ask you that directly, but it's in their eyes. So um, how do you answer that? Um, how do you build a strategy around that? That's some of the, uh, this is one of the, the, the questions that I, I put in this uh, presentation. Basically, I have three sections here, some basics about the, the actual approach to lobbying, um, not necessarily a professional approach, full-time approach, but for anyone who lobbies, even part-time, uh, I think that's helpful. Secondly, one of my key arguments here is if you want to be successful in lobbying, you better understand yourself as a service person for policymakers. You need to be their advisor, okay? That's, that's your role as an expert. Now, if you're working for a local government, if you're a civil servant, then actually you're being paid for that, okay? You are being paid to advise policymakers on how to do youth policy or finance youth work um, and all of these things, but how to be a good advisor to policymakers. And I put this under the headline, Council to Kings, because that's an ancient subject that has been around for 5,000 years. When, when they started politics 5,000 years ago in the first, uh, first cities on, in the world, um, well, the first thing that a king needed was a policy advisor. So, lobbying is very much about advising politicians. If you don't want to be an advisor, then it can be something else, like a protester or a complainer or a petitioner, but I think you should be counsel. And third, uh, putting things together is some tips on making strategy. It's not very sophisticated, but it's something that you can start with. I was thinking, looking through your agenda, okay, these people are uh, investing two days, uh, traveling far and investing two days to work on uh, a basic document about youth work in Europe. 
uh, that has a political function quite clearly. It, it contains political things. Um, and these people want to make sure that their voice is being heard when you go out with all your wonderful new ideas that you got from the exchange with your international colleagues. But how do you do that? Um, well, you will discuss that probably or some of the ideas later on when I'm done. Um, I hope that gives you some ideas. Now, the text that has been distributed, I have been assured, is a summary of my talk, but it also contains extra things that will not elaborate here in my oral talk. Uh, it's a five-pager. I think it's relatively practical um, and not too academic. Uh, and this is not going to be an academic lecture anyway, okay? So I'm, I'm mainly interested in political management, which is a practice. It's not a science. It's partly a little bit of science. It's a lot of art. <laughs> Uh, but most of it is it's a practice, okay? So um, I'll try to be as practical as I can. Section one, the lobby is cracked. Um, yes, I've, I've seen people walk around with, uh, with T-shirts like that in Washington. Um, I don't know whether you want to be called a lobbyist. If you're a polite society and people talk uh, over a glass of wine, what do you do for a living? You want to say, I'm a lobbyist? I don't know, um, but maybe it's not too bad. You are in good company. I mean, there are tens of thousands of lobby lobbyists around Europe. Most of them actually are doing it part-time as part of some kind of other job where it's necessary to influence public policy. However, if you talk about lobbyists as such, uh, then there are, of course, plenty of, of the usual suspects, particularly from business, various trade associations, labor unions, professional associations, including professional association of youth workers, I suppose, or social workers, lots of NGOs, lots of hired guns from lawyers to communication specialists and so on. Think tanks, yes, professors are often included in lobbying because they're knowledge workers and they are often producing the ideas that then lobbyists uh, go on and, uh, and take uh, to the policymakers. And of course, governments lobby each other. That's maybe kind of new as an idea, but they do all the time. Of course, the German government lobbies the European Commission. Uh, a local uh, government lobbies the regional government or provincial government. A provincial government lobbies the national government. And uh, sometimes you have a regional government from one country lobbying the national government of another. That works all the time, of course. Then there are also other public entities, including universities that have their own interest and organize it and communicate it and want to influence public policy. So there's plenty of people around and of course there are ugly lobbyists and even uglier lobbyists. Some people have interests that are not in the commonwealth or the, the public interest, very private special interests. But on the other hand, isn't that what democracy is all about? That it's a competition of interests? Uh, so it's very much about pluralism. However, the world of professional lobbyists is, of course, very different from what you do or from most of what you do. Um, so let me just uh, give you a very quick introduction from a consulting firm called Hill & Knowlton. It's a very traditional American firm that also works a lot in, in Europe. And for their clients, because they want to explain to their own clients what lobbying is, uh, a couple of years ago they, they uh, did this video, and it's kind of cheeky, but I think uh, it's nice to understand what it's, what it's really about. Um, can we go?
disclaimer, I'm not working for Helen Knowlton. I know, of course, some of the people there, and they're nice people, but believe me, they are way too expensive for you. <laughs> so you better do it yourself. Um, anyways, um, the, the basics are already here. Well, what is it all about? Okay? It's, it's, it's not rocket science. You try to know the players, the political actors that actually make the decisions and the people who prepare them. You analyze what's going on, the politics, okay, who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down, what's going on, what's on the agenda, and how are the decisions being made, what are the priorities and policy. You help them tell the story um, as a consultant, uh, or you tell the story yourself. Uh, make sure that it matters, that, that that gets hurt. You build support, meaning you build majorities in decision-making councils. And what's very important is the timing is the corridor in which you can really have a decision, and that's the window of opportunity. Um, by the way, a lot of you are taking your, your smartphones to take pictures. I mean, I'm happy to uh, give you the presentation, so this can be distributed as well as a PDF or something like that, so you don't have to you know, fill your, your storage of your smartphone. Better take some nice pictures outside <laughs> if the sun comes back. Okay, I gave you a quick definition because that's what professors do, okay? They're droning on about definitions. What is direct lobbying and what is indirect lobbying? Because it's often confusing. Um, a lot of people, particularly in youth work, think, oh, mm, lobbying is kind of political work. Political work is like publicity, so we need to have a nice event like bringing a bunch of young people together and they write some postcards and put them on a, a colorful balloon and let it uh, fly in the air or something like that and then we have nice pictures and then politicians will do what we want. It doesn't work like that. Uh, you can have, of course, public events, publicity events, media events, uh, communicate with the media, but that's part of rather public relations, whereas a lot of direct lobbying is really non-public. It's rather special. That's why I would say, yes, you can bring in young people to lobby um, as constituents of politicians, for example, but a lot of the direct lobbying actually falls to people who do youth work um, for a living. Um, but let me just define what it is. Number one, it's project-based. It's a project-based attempt to influence people. And I say project-based because you need concrete project goals. If it's just about general networking with politicians, that, that's not lobbying. That's just an opportunity to have a contact which allows you to lobby, okay? But you need concrete goals. And you do it with sometimes elected public officials and sometimes with appointed officials. Um, and very often you work with their staff. So you might actually work with somebody you could define also as youth because it's a 23-year-old uh, political office worker um, and not the politician himself or herself, but that staff person might be as important as anyone else. And in politics, there are a lot of young people actually who work behind the scenes. It, you need a decision-making process where public policy comes to light, where it's being born, okay? Uh, policy is being formulated or implemented, and it doesn't really matter what it is, whether it's a law, whether it's a financial decision, a budget decision, or even symbolic action. Um, it has to be public policy, public policy. And the point about lobbying is that it is being done by people who are not formally part of the decision-making process, okay? Now, you may have an informal role in the decision-making process, but not a formal one. You are not part of the decision-making because you're not a decision-maker. As a lobbyist, you're always outside the decision. You can still participate in some way, um, but not formally. And finally, direct lobbying is about direct contact, okay? You talk with people, or you write them a letter, or you give them a document, or something like that. It doesn't really matter what the channel is. It might be an event like this. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still direct. It's face-to-face -face or person-to-person -person in, in some way. It's not mediate. Indirect lobbying is anything that supports these direct lobbying functions. Uh, by influencing usually other people, other influencers um, in the environment of the decision maker. This might include the mass media, for example, your local newspaper, local radio station, social media, or whatever, if it influences public debate and public opinion. It's part of that, and yes, you can also mobilize citizens. 
including young people, of course, to contact their elected representatives or appointed officials. And if you do it very systematically, then uh, the Americans like to call it, we use it in Europe too, a grassroots campaign, because that's where the, the grassroots of democracy are always at the citizen level, okay? So you want citizens to pick up the phone and call them and say, this is what we want, or this is what we need. Then this is also indirect lobbying, but the direct face-to-face -face, uh, idea here is, of course, between citizens and their representatives, but if you mobilize them, then it's kind of an indirect approach. Now, what's the core part here? As a lobbyist, you need to know something about policy. But you also need to know a lot about the politics of policy. Now, there are very few English native speakers in this room. So for most of them here in the room, you speak a European language that only has one word for politics. Politik, politica, or whatever it is. Now, when the English say politics of policy, it would sound very stupid in most other languages because it would be like politica, politica, and what is that? Um, the point is that in English language, politics stands for process, competition, rivalry, the things that are about winning and losing and processing decisions, whereas policy is the content of these decisions. <coughs> they are not really separate in the real world, but the point here is you cannot really just concentrate on policy as a lobbyist. You have to understand the politics of it, okay, the process. Uh, you need to know the world. And as I said before, it's very important that as a lobbyist you understand that lobbying is not just about saying what you want, it's about serving someone else, servicing decision makers or policy makers. So basically you open your toolbox in order to help them. Now, there are sometimes cliches around, like the one that I showed you before, that what a lobbyist really does is, you know, whining and dining, take policymakers out to fancy restaurants, um, you know, pay for their, their alcohol, pay for uh, their travels, uh, bribe them, and even, you know, whatever, uh, you know, uh, do things that are not necessarily on very mor moral high ground. But the main point about lobbyists is what they really want to do is they want to be helpful, practically helpful, for the policymaker to do their job. Okay? That's why they get a call back, because the policymaker will think, oh, I need to call this lobbyist because it will make my own job easier. They can deliver arguments, problem definitions. They offer solutions, really, that might include a lot of data that only you have, because you know a lot more about youth and youth work than they. It's about facts. It's about figures. It's about telling authentic stories uh, about how people live. Very often, it's also about political intelligence in the sense that, as a lobbyist, you may know a lot about what other politicians do or want, or what is going on at the basic citizen level. So in a way, what you can offer to policymakers is a, some competitive advantage. Since po most policymakers are rivaling for power and resources, it doesn't matter whether it's an elected politician or an appointed bureaucrat, they all are rivals of someone else. So they compete with others, and if you can help them compete, that's good for them. That also includes uh, helping them to get access to other experts, okay, or be accepted, get a reputation at a policy community. Um, because what politicians want is really to be seen as people who are accepted in making public policy and do it well, or even be a leader. And being a leader is of course also something that you want to communicate to your voters, particularly with politicians who are elected, they want to be re-elected. Re so you help them with that. Um, now, if you go back a couple of thousand years, uh, one of the first political advisors uh, was Aristotle, and uh, he tutored young Alexander the Great. And Aristotle was, of course, also one of the first political scientists, and he talks in his Politica uh, about advising politicians. And he used this picture of advisors being the eyes and ears and hands and feet of political leaders. It was the practice of kings to make themselves many eyes and ears and hands and feet for to make colleagues of those who are the friends of themselves and their government. 
So you want to be a friend of the government. You want to be made a collegial advisor at eye level and help them govern. You want to be their tool, their eye, their ear to hear better, okay? Your, their hand, their feet to run better, to do something better. If you can get that kind of reputation, then you have the chance to actually be a king's counsel. Mm -hmm. Now, counseling political leaders has been around and thinking, as I said before, uh, before for thousands of years, and it's not easy for politicians or any policymaker, including appointed officials, to actually make a decision on who should advise them. Picking the right advisors, picking the right advice, and taking the advice in the right way is difficult, and the access that other people have to you is, is a political resource that people guard very closely. Um, and one of the reasons is, of course, that uh, if you listen to uh, political advisors and they say different things, they have different priorities, it can be quite confusing. All right, there will be no more gods women. Oh, right. I knew there was going to be a black mouse. No, not listen to me. I tried to tell you. Oh, fine. I could have told you this was going to happen. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Please, sir, if I might have a word with you. For those of you who are into computer gaming, this is one of the first editions of Civilization, where there are lots of political advisors to help you do strategy, and usually it ends in chaos. Um, now, as a good advisor, and this is one of the most famous psychological advisors in the world, um, I mean, you have a, a certain role to fill, and that you want to support the process of decision making. You want, ideally, to improve the rationality of the process, you clarify to the decision maker what the alternatives are and what the trade-offs are. There's always a compromise involved. You cannot have everything, okay? So how do you trade off the, the different things? And if you help them actually make a decision, then you also, also, you also want to help them, uh, help them transport that decision and communicate it to the people who matters and legitimize um, the actual decision. So that's quite a lot. And of course, it helps if you don't just have your own perspective, but you take the perspective of the actual decision maker. Uh, look at their information needs, not your decision need, but their information need before they take a decision. Look at their time constraints that they have. Look at their interest, their special field of policy, their constituency, uh, and think about how can my advice help them serve the, that better. Look at the advantage, advantages that a certain decision alternative have and consider whether it's doable or feasible from their perspective and whether the whole process can be managed. Um, put yourself in the shoes of the decision maker as an advisor. And if you do that well and they understand it, they will call you again because you are helpful to them. You are their ears and feet, their hands, their rise, okay? You help them with intelligence and actually do and implement the decision. Now, if you want to be a good lobbyist, you're basically the person who understands politicians deeply. In order to do that, of course, you, get, you have to get to know them. So you have to, have to spend time around politicians and department leaders, and you may need to understand that their worldview and their rhetoric uh, differs a little bit from, from yours. I'm going to skip this here um, because I think it's relatively clear. Let's move over to the, the final section on making strategies so we have some time for questions. But the first thing that you saw here on the last chart was their main interest is to survive in office. That's also true for the appointed department leader, okay? They want to be successful, yes, but they want to be a survivor first. That means keeping on power, keeping influence, winning office, um, defending it, defending yourself, but also to show yourself as a decision maker, as a good, solid decision maker who can get things done. Everybody is frustrated about a public official who does not get things done. They want to see themselves as people who get things done. That's sort of like the definition. That's why they are there. If you help them get things done, they will call you again. But 
moving through the corridors of power is, of course, a tricky navigational game for you. I'm not here to tell you what your institutional setup is. For some of you, it's relatively simple. For others who work maybe in a big city, uh, might be a lot more complex. I heard that yesterday there was a big working group based on a presentation on uh, youth policy making in Lisbon, which is a relatively big city. Uh, so there are lots and lots of players with lots and lots of institutional settings, and it's not easy to work with all these people, talk to all of these people. So if, also if you now contact other regional governments or national governments or even the European level, then you're out there and uh, it might be quite a multi-level game that's um, overly complex for the stock. For others, it's relatively simple because you go to your town hall and you know the 20 most important people and you can talk to all of them. Um, however, even if you understand the setting, the institution, the general technicalities of decision making, then you might still forget that uh, the, the key thing here is that you always have to know what you want. What is it that you want them to do? A lot of time, people who lobby come to politicians, just tell them about their problems. And then the one thing that politicians all over the world do is they nod and say, yeah, I look into it. Yeah, that's important. Thank you for sharing that. I'll, I'll work on the problem, sure. But they have no idea what you want them to do. So formulating the ask, what do you want them to do? What are you going to pitch to them? And ask them directly, that's important. It's too often too unclear. So that's one of the first things that you have to put in your mind. Then the next thing is, what is it that you really want to do with the political process in your lobbying approach? Um, this is the ship's telegraph. So you think about it with the direction. You want to forward or backward in the process? And at what speed? Full speed, half speed, you want to slow down, dead slow, finish the engine, have the engine on standby? Uh, do you want to, the ship to turn? Do you want to change the direction or stay in the course? You want to uh, broaden the pathway, so to bring in more people and have more people participate in the, in the process or narrow it down so fewer people and fewer interests are in there. And what do you do if there's an accident, a roadblock? What if people do errors, okay? Uh, go in the wrong direction. Maybe you want to correct that. A lot of lobbying is about repairing and correcting political decisions. So a lot of what professional lobbyists tell me what they really think they are, they are firefighters. There's always a fire that pops up somewhere because somebody does something wrong. So they get there fast with a bucket full of water and try to correct it. Um, so in a way, you're kind of like a, a, a traffic cop that's uh, you know, trying to correct uh, the misbehavior of people. If you are choosing your target groups, you cannot usually talk to everybody. You want, don't want to talk to people who are totally neutral and not interested in your topics, have no influence, and, or are even your, your enemies um, who want something else. You want to concentrate your efforts on people who already support you or are potential supporters, potential swingers, so you can persuade them. Um, and the rest you basically leave alone. Why? You never have enough time. This is, this is basically a concept from political campaigns, from election campaigns, where you concentrate on the swing voters and the people that you need to mobilize that are already behind you. You're not going to take away a lot of people from the other party, okay? And if they're not interested in you, leave them alone. Um, you never have the time for them. So some quick final tips and thoughts for your work before we uh, take to the questions. Um, whoops. Ooh. Talking about accidents. Number one, policymakers are humans. And the people that they are orienting to and for whom they work, meaning citizens, organized citizens, voters, they're humans too, meaning they're very often emotional and they make decisions on low information, okay? So it's a combination of heads and hearts and just gut feeling. And people want to know that whatever you propose is plausible. If you can prove that it's plausible and you touch an emotional chord, that's good. If you cannot do that, pure rationality is probably not going to work. So um, 
it's not just about knowledge and transferring knowledge to people, but winning the head and the heart and also the gut feeling. Okay, they have to have the feeling that it's, it's generally right. The thing that you already know is that people are complicated. Um, and they work in complicated processes. So you need to think about whether your proposal, your policy idea fits with the general culture of the decision makers um, and what these actors want in their organizations, their institutions. If it doesn't fit, you're going to have a much harder time. If it works, you still have to ask yourself, what do you gain for all the pain? So you want political actors to spend political capital on your political idea. There must be some change, and that kind of transformation comes with a cost. So if you think about that cost in order to have the change, will it be really worth the effort for the politician? This is extremely um, important to know because otherwise they'll just, you know, take to something else. Number three here, it's important to think politics in terms of party. It's still important. Yes, I know that at the local level, parties are often less important. You can get elected mayor in many countries, in many cities without a party. But generally, parties, political parties, are still necessary for government and for organizing groups. <coughs> you need to respect that. And they should carry your policy idea. You don't want to take it and you know, don't think about the, the party. And in some way, you need to consider what the parties may think about your policy ideas, and you want to make it compatible to what the party uh, thinks or, you know, part of the program, or you think at least about uh, making it sweet for parties to agree with, because they will not go away. Finally, it's a process. Politics is very much a process, okay? It's a lot of stop and go, it's very gameful in a way, and it can be endless. It can be an endless waiting game for you, so you need to be patient. Timing is very, very important. Timing matters a lot for politicians, and everybody who's in politics full-time knows that. So the difference between a wonderful, successful proposal and a bad proposal that goes nowhere is just, very often, it's just timing. So you need to consider the process, which is usually fluid, and you don't have a single authority that makes a decision, but rather you have plenty of actors that all are playing with the timing. Or in other words, politicians are always basing their decisions not on principle, but on a daily situation assessment. Today, can I win over people, win support for an idea? Today or tomorrow, is there room for a new initiative? Can I win people over or is there time and room for, for a new conflict to start, a new battlefront to open up? So if people come to the conclusion, yes, today is the day, then you better be able to speed up fast. You need to be prepared that the process suddenly moves very, very fast. Although maybe for months or even years you had to be patient and nothing ever happened, but that's politics also. Now, I began saying that very often politicians are confused because they don't really know what the lobbyists want from them. So again, don't forget to pitch the ask. They need to know what you want them to do, what to do today or tomorrow. What is it you want? You want them to write a letter, a legislative proposal, a certain vote, up, up or down, yes or no? Do you want them to talk to someone else or move the process? Don't forget to pitch the ask. Okay, I think that's enough for now. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. I do think we have some time for, for questions and I'm happy to answer anything or discuss anything that's on your mind after this input. Yes, indeed, we do have some time for questions. So we can gather around three questions, maybe some questions online if they pop up as well. So whoever has a question, be ready. I will try to throw you this um, catch box. Yeah, any questions? Okay, very bad. <laughs> and maybe I will carry it to you, you know. Here you go. Okay. Hello. Hello. 
<laughs> That's a very dark voice. Hello. Hello, my name is Mark Boots. Uh, just one question. The problem I see a bit is, is that uh, if I would have to lobby for oil, I need to know everything about oil and why it's useful. Uh, when I would lobby for tomatoes, I need to know everything about tomatoes and why we should put in money because they're really important for us. And then I come to the problem that I'm not doing that and sometimes I'm lobbying uh, for youth work, which means I must be able to explain what youth work is. Yeah. And there the problem starts at the moment. <laughs> Maybe we can gather some more questions and then... Well, let me just answer oh, that, that yeah. quickly. Um, well, actually, your problem is shared by most lobbyists that are doing it full time. Most of the time, the politicians they approach have no idea what they're talking about. So they are really educators and explainers, and they do it at a very, very basic level. Yes, you do always have some poli policy makers that are experts, but 99% of them are not. And that's particularly true at the local level where most of the people who do politics are, or the politicians are actually amateurs. Um, so the explaining part, you know, the, the pedagogical thing, where you explain the basics, it's, it's part of the job. And if you do that right, you're good, okay? Um, as far as the expertise is concerned, I think some of the most important lobbyists are not the people who are perfect substance experts. They are not policy experts, the experts for the politics of policy, but they do know the people who know everything about the policy field. So your job really is to organize, to find, identify, find, and organize, and transport the necessary information for the policymaker. That's your job, you're a transporter. You're not necessarily the, the perfect policy expert. And yes, there are oil lobbyists or tomato lobbyists who know everything about oil or tomato, but there are oil lobbyists that switch over to tomatoes and tomato lobbyists who think, oh, a nicer employer, let's go from tomatoes to oil and try that. Um, people are switching around in the lobbying world all the time, uh, transporting totally different policy ideas. Why can they do that? Because they're experts on lobbying and political communication, really, rather than the substance. I think that can work for you. And believe me, there are a lot more complex uh, policy issues out there than youth work. <laughs> Harder to understand. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your question. Yes, I would like to ask you to throw it to the next person. Um, do we have some more questions? No? Are you writing them there online? It is. Yeah. Here? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm Karen. I'm also from PAUI, Professional Open Use Work. And what is our problem is because we, work, we lobby because of our jobs also on local level up to European level, and it's a time thing. And we lobby sometimes for our jobs. Yep. We lobby sometimes for the financial parts. But what I find most difficult is in the local part because I'm living in a small city. I know all the actors. I have a moral problem with parties, with some of them, but some of them are nicer than the others, even they are not really with the target group, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really torn as a person sometimes, ethically, morally, but also financially. And at the, the time, because I'm not actually um, engaged as a, user, uh, as, a, as a lobbyist, but I do it because I, I think for my values that's necessary for and I think many people do this here so mm. this I this is my my most difficult part in my life that I never know should I put my efforts there or should I put my efforts there where I get my money from so this is this is always this torn personality right. yeah uh, thank you Karen well I think a lot of people in this room uh, have similar problems um, now obviously if your job hinges on it and you need the money uh, to pay yourself or what you do well, uh, then it is important. But that's really the priority uh, game that you have in everyday life. Um, as far as the, uh, the part-time thing is concerned, maybe you can combine one thing with the other. So, I mean, the classic youth workers probably interest in helping young people become advocates for themselves. And maybe the young people, the kids, 
the youth are your best resource. So if you work with them and you want to help them communicate uh, what they want better, then you know, bring them together with politicians and, uh, and the bureaucrats and uh, let them do the messaging. Um, you don't have to do everything yourself. You can try to organize others, including also parents of, of young people and so on. Maybe there are already organizations like parents' organizations that you can enable to do lobbying efforts that you cannot do for yourself. So actually, and that's, that's generally one thing, you don't go alone all the time. It's very often about coalition building, finding others and sharing resources. And maybe they don't have the same problem that you have, but they have the same interest. So that can work on a platform. Collaborate, work with the young people, work with other existing organizations and work with politicians who are sympathetic. Now, as far as the parties are concerned, well, that's the professional approach if you are okay to work with people you don't like, okay? Because you want to get something done. If they're important as decision makers, it's not your personal preference, it's your professional job. Uh, and maybe you hate this person, you hate their politics, you hate their party, but as a successful lobbyist, you will help them do them their job. That's kind of service to people you don't like, but that's part of it. Just okay. sorry. Thank you. Yeah, we, we have one more question here and one from online world. Um, do I, should I make it? Uh -oh. <laughs> All good? Okay, here you go. Thank you. I'm Hans, the Flying Dutchman. Um, and the question I have to you is, um, uh, could you tell us something about uh, um, quality of uh, lobbying uh, to different fields, tomatoes, uh, oil.